Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, where we discuss all sorts of things Germanic heathenry related. My name is Jesse. I am your host. Let's get into it. Um, thank you for tuning in today, as always. Thank you for showing your support to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, Midgard Musings as a whole, subscribing to the YouTube channel, following the podcast on wherever it is that you absorb your podcast content. Um, the Today's show is going to be a little bit of a different format, as you are about to see, and as you can perhaps tell by the title of this uh, podcast episode and video, is that um, I'm going to be sharing with you all the um, Heathenry 101 class that I sort of, uh, well, I didn't sort of, I delivered um, during Shadow Moot last year, last October, um, the event that was uh, hosted and is hosted every year by the folks at Raven Moon Hearth up in Springfield, Tennessee. So um, I've had this, this content kind of just, you know, sitting in the docket, as it were, um, waiting to be released. Um, and today I'm going to release it. But the reason why it's kind of just been sitting there, um, number one, is I just hadn't taken the time to put all of the, the content that I filmed together um, and fill in the gaps that were needed. So there were some technical issues during Shadow Moot that I was experiencing that uh, kind of prevented me from doing the whole class in just one continuous uh, thing. I had to stop, re you know, fire up the camera again and and, you know, you'll notice there's some times where I'm out of frame. It's, it's visually speaking, it's, it's not the best work that I've done. Um, and again, thanks to the technical issues that I was having where the, the, the camera would just stop recording, I'm, I'm, I'm having to come back and fill in some of those gaps. So there's going to be times where you're going to see me in the setting at Shadow Moot, as you're about to see here in just a little bit. And then there's going to be times where I'm going to be sitting here filling in those gaps that were left undone and, and, uh, you know, that, that didn't make it into the, the final cut, as it were. So it's going to be a combined effort. So for all of those people that are watching this on the video platforms, you're going to see me going back and forth into some different settings, and, you know, it's going to sound a little bit different, look a bit different, of course. And then there's going to be those times where uh, I'll be back here and sounding and looking just as I do right now. Um, so for everybody listening, you know, you're going to notice, again, just some audio differences. So bear that in mind. That's why. Uh, but it is a Heathenry 101 class I did um, back in October at Shadow Moot, trying to just kind of introduce people to some heathen worldviews, topics, um, stuff like that. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of uh, feedback on certain topics of this video, um, so we shall see. Um, but for right now, before we go further, I would like to uh, ask, as always, for you guys to, if you do like the podcast, if you like what I do, if you like the videos... Anything that I do on the channel, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe, click the bell notification when you do, so that way you can choose how you want to get notified. Hopefully you're choosing all notifications. Um, and be sure to share this video around, share this content around as best you can, wherever you can. You know, invite some people to jump down into the comments section, share your thoughts. If you do want to share your thoughts outside of the comments section, you want to remain anonymous, you can uh, send me an email and I will share your thoughts that way. Or I uh, can also receive your anonymous phone call. You can call the Midgard Musings hotline. That number is 615-671-9832. Uh, you can call and leave a voicemail. You don't have to say your name, but if you'd like your voice heard and your thoughts heard on the podcast, uh, leave me a voicemail. Um, it's, a, it's a Google voice number, guys. So again, you don't have to worry about you know me contacting you back or, or any of that information being shared. It's just a Google voice number. Um, it's strictly for the podcast, for the channel. Um, and so if you want to share your thoughts about things that way, you're welcome to do so. Don't forget to click on the link tree link that's down in the description and show notes of this podcast as every other podcast episode as well. Um, it's going to contain all of the, my social media information, uh, Patreon, my, my, uh, merchandise store, um, and any other ways that you want to choose to support, you know, what I do here. Um, so that's all there is to that, all the housekeeping stuff. You guys know the deal. Uh, but let's get into this uh, Heathenry 101 thing that I delivered back into uh, 
uh, that I delivered back in, in, in 2022 at the annual Shadow Mood event. Hope you guys enjoy it. I'll see you back and forth here, you know, different settings. Um, but let me know what you think down in the comment section at the end of this video. And I sure appreciate it. Enjoy. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, for everybody that hasn't met me yet, my name is Jesse. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Midgard Musings. If you guys like heathenry, Norse pagan type stuff, please subscribe. And I also do a podcast on that channel once a week called Random Heathen Ramblings. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts, so check check out the Random Heathen Ramblings uh, podcast, Spotify, Pandora, wherever you absorb that stuff. But the class for today, the what I'm trying to do is is give you like a breakdown of, of some heathen uh, worldviews, concepts, words, things that you may hear tossed around in conversations here or other places that you go to. And just kind of give you an understanding a little bit about a 101 crash course of, of heathenry, which is pretty tough to do because there's so many branches off of this one pagan tree that you can go off on. And um, But I'm going to do my best to try to introduce mainly newcomers or, or people that are thinking about coming into heathenry, you know, just some entry-level understanding of things. So some of the topics that I want to talk about are going to be what does it mean to be heathen specifically? you know, giving a brief look into the origins of the word itself and separating the seemingly uh, similar names. So you're going to hear me talk about the term also true. You're going to hear me talk about um, foreign say or, or old ways heathenry. We're going to talk a little bit about Odinism and, and all of that. So there's various words that people can use to kind of talk about their heathenry and we're going to try, try to break down in some of those a bit. I want to talk about heathenry as a religion um, and understanding our relationships as people between our ancestors, the Vatir or the whites, the, the land and uh, the spirits of the land and, and home around us, um, and our existence between the gods and goddesses, as well as each other. It's, it's all interconnected. Talk a little bit about some heathen concepts. We're talking about worldviews, things, uh, words like frith, worth, weird, Orlog, sin, some of these concepts that do exist in heathenry that need a little bit of context added to them. Seeing the world through a heathen's eyes, our, our worldviews, or, or a heathen worldview. Um, talk a little bit about heathen rituals, differences between bloat, offerings, or what are sometimes called feignings. Um, and then open it up for Q&As, so if I could get through the topics um, if anybody has questions afterwards, I'm happy to, you know, answer them as best I can. But so to start with, and uh, this is going to be pretty lesson-like. I, I had to keep it all organized for me, so appreciate you understanding on that. But the definition of the word heathen. So uh, the popular definition um, it would be uh, uh, of or relating to people or nations that do not acknowledge the God of the Bible, the Abrahamic God, and an unconverted member of a people or nation who do not acknowledge the Abrahamic God of the Bible. Now that's the popular definition, okay? The term pagan is a sort of umbrella term that covers a multitude of, of polytheistic belief structures, whereas the term heathen tends to be used mostly when describing a very particular approach to paganism, that being a pre-Christian uh, era Germanic belief structure. The word heathen has etymological roots in languages that predate modern English, and the meanings uh, are, are quite different. So we have an Old English word, and I'm, for anybody here that speaks Old English or, or knows the, the, the bill, if I'm, if I'm mispronouncing it, just forgive me for that. But the Old English word haven is a word that would be uh, used to def define someone who is not Christian or, or not Jewish, you know. Uh, it could also be used as a noun, you know, heathen man, one of a race or nation which does not acknowledge, again, the God of the Bible. Um, this was particularly true amongst the Danes. Um, but it merged with the Old Norse, haven. Heathen or pagan from Proto-Germanic, haithana. Um, there's also sources of Old Saxon, uh, heathen, 
Old Frisian heathen, Dutch heathen, Old High German heidon. So these are uncertain origins, but they all mean close to one of the same things. So the Proto-Germanic word, which is Proto-Germanic is, is where we have the modern English language, where Old English, Old Norse, these are all Germanic language and they, they originated from, from Proto-Germanic. So the Proto-Germanic word Haidana referred to people who literally lived on the heath, the land. They were country folk. So the term heathen is literally the heath dwellers, those who live in and on the land. Those country bumpkins may, maybe could be a, a modern word for them, right? But as Christianity began to spread into the north, these terms became derogatory uh, to identify people who did not worship a Judeo-Christian God. So under the term heathenry, you're going to hear various terms, as I mentioned before, used to describe the religious side of it. Okay, also true being one of them, Norse paganism, Germanic polytheism, Odinism, foreign state, etc. Okay, there are, they may seem like just different words to describe the same thing. Uh, but I do want to kind of break down some of these more popular ones and, and give you their specific meaning. So we'll start with also true. This is technically the modern term for the type of Northern European religious practices that we're talking about today, especially here in the United States. It's, it, it's the, uh, one of the only recognized pagan religions in Iceland. They have an, a whole federation, the Ossetrufiligi, I believe, is the organization over there. Um, but it is, if you were to identify as a, as a pagan religiously, Ossetru would probably be the one that you could legally adopt, right? Um, but it's a compound word. The word Ossetru starts with the word Ossa or Os uh, being a singular form of the name for the Aesir gods and goddesses. The Aesir gods are a tribe of the you know, uh, Norse pantheon, so Odin, Thor, those guys. So you have the first part of the word Asa, meaning singular god, and then true, meaning faith. So the word Asa true could be understood as faith in the gods, faith in the Aesir, um, specifically. So... The pantheon of the Norse gods, as I mentioned, is, consists of multiple factions, tribes, as it were. The Aesir gods, such as Odin, Thor, Tyr, Heimdall, and those. And then you have the Vanir tribe of the gods, like Freya, Freyr, Njord, their father. So even though also true could be you know, faith in the Aesir, uh, most, if not all, practitioners of, of this you know, version of paganism find a place in their work to honor and venerate the Vanir gods and goddesses as well. Um, Norse paganism or Germanic polytheism are pretty generic terms that generally mean the same thing, although you might have some um, that are identifying themselves as Germanic polytheists that specifically use that term to, uh, in their approach um, on more mainland Europe, so Saxony, uh, the Saxon heathens, um, Anglo-Saxons the mainland Europe, not the northern Scandinavian uh, areas. So besides regional or cultural uh, variants, the gods themselves have different names. So for instance, Odin was Wodan, Thor was uh, Donar, Tyr was Tu, right, to the Saxons and to the folks in mainland Germania. Um, Odinism. This one is a term that you may hear certain people refer to as, um, I'm, a, I'm a pagan and I'm an Odinist. It's be careful when dealing with people that use this term to identify themselves as, as, as heathens because Odinism uh, has, has very strong ties to, um, first of all, the prison system. Most of the, the, the people that came out of uh, an institution are, are picked it up in there. Um, but it's deeply rooted in fascist Nazi bullshit, okay? Um, there were definitely cults of Odin at a time in, in ancient pagan times. There were definitely different subsets of, of tribes of people who had a very specific focus on a god or, or more than one god or goddess. You know, you have cults of Thor, cults of Odin. Um, but it's not the same thing as Odinism now. It's, it's become a bastardization of that, you know, cultic focus on a specific deity. Um, and so it's a scourge to me on, on the label of, of heathenry, as it were. 
to, to have Odinism lumped into that because it's not the same thing. Um, they're not even particularly heathen. It's, if, if anything, it's kind of like this Christianity, but take the Jesus out and replace it with Odin kind of thing. Okay. Foreign save, foreign seether, old ways. That's a word, or th those words, foreign seed, it literally means old ways. It's generally speaking or referring to folks who take a very historical, reconstructionist approach to the, to the religion, deeply rooted in making sure that what is being done can be backed up by historical or archaeological uh, sources. Um, so foreign seed or foreign seed or heathens are usually the ones to really challenge anyone that says anything about, you know, well, this is what, this is how it is, or this is the way, well, where's your source, right? They're always asking for citations um, and, and making sure that what they tell you is, is, is backed up by those sources as well. Um, you may also hear the term ald sidu, uh, which is an old Saxon word meaning old ways. It's again, a compound word. Ald is the Saxon word for old, sidu, seethe, right? ways, old ways. Very knowledgeable. You can, I mean, I've learned a lot from, from folks who have a very historical reconstructionist approach to heathenry. They've helped point me in the direction of learning you know, source material and, and getting answers from what we have written down in, in those texts. Um, but again, very, very extremely focused on, on historical accuracy uh, to doing things like ritual and, and all that. So heathenry as a religion, now that we've kind of broken down the various names and terms, one thing I do want to preface is, much like what Jared was, was saying around the fire last night, is that nobody here can tell anyone else how to heathen, right? There's no instruction manual. There's no uh, book of instructions to, to tell you how to do this. So you heathen how you want to heathen. But heathenry as a religion generate more than just the gods and the goddesses, right? There, there's more to the, a heathen's practice of, of, of as a religion than to just, you know, deal with, with the sacred. Um, we honor our ancestors. We recognize the living and uh, spirits that are around us, referring to the Vaitir, or whites. Um, the gods and goddesses are definitely a part of, of the mix for such events as we're having here. You know, we, there's interaction between people, there's interaction between the spirits and, and whatnot of the land, and then there's a dedicated time for dealing with uh, and, and, and venerating and worshiping the gods. One thing to import, one, one important thing to uh, remember, for, especially for newer heathens, you know, coming into this is you're, you're coming into a, 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 a way of, of viewing the world, and if, especially if you're coming into heathenry from a Christian background or any other religious background, you, you bring some of those worldviews with you. It's, you can call it baggage, whatever, but you, you, you bring your, your past with you when you come into heathenry. And one of the things that uh, some newer heathens tend to overlook is the importance of developing their own hearth cult. So hearth cults are what we do individually, perhaps as a family, um, within the sovereignty of your own huts or homes. And that's why much of the, you know, religion of heathenry is unknown because most of these traditions of that, that were held and, and carried at a certain point in time were kept at the hearth level. They were done within the, the, the safety, the, the sanctity, the sovereignty of the home. They weren't written down. They were passed down orally, right? So one way that one family might do something is going to be different than another family that does something it's going to vary based off of their their customs and their traditions their hearth cult okay and it and it rings through to to how certain holidays certain holy tides certain major events were observed for instance we're you know in and around the time of winter nights like we heard about last night in Norway, in, in, in ancient times, and the Norwegians would have it very closed off. There wasn't a big assembly of people to, to celebrate winter nights. It was done between the families only. Whereas the Swedes had something more like this, where it was a, a grander assembly and it was a bigger to-do and had more uh, community involvement. Um, 
So Hearth Cult is our own thing. It's what we do and should be developed in that way. Um, so before you get into what do I do with the gods, how do I give gifts, how do I offer, how do I bloat, how do I sacrifice, whatever. How do I do all these things with the gods? Is You need to first approach how am I going to do things within my home because that's where heathenry is, is, is the heart of it, is in the hearth, is in the home. So again, not telling you how to do it, but just when you come into heathenry, as you look to, 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 to develop your practices in, in, as, in a religious context, consider the fact that you want to have a good, strong hearth cult first. But with that being, you know, with that being said, um, some examples include such things as establishing a sacred space in your home, maybe a corner of a room, you know, a, a, a mantelpiece above the fireplace, a dresser, cabinet, something uh, that you can dedicate as the focus area of, of your practices, of your of your hearth cult, of your individual cultic practices. So you call it an altar, call it whatever you want. Um, but we know that even in folklore, it, it's, you know, Germanic folklore is, is, is rife with stories of uh, Husvetir, or what are called Kof gods in the Saxon sides of things. Um, it's a household spirit that shares existence with the family. So a very common thing, uh, again, that, that we've seen throughout lore, folklore, is, you know, gifts were left within the home to keep the Husvetir or the, or the, the Kof god happy, right? Um, this could be things like coffee, grains, porridge, right? It was believed to keep the, the whites of the home, the, the guardian of the home, the god of the home, as it were, happy, because when the Kof god is happy, everybody is happy, right? So depending on your living arrangements, if you're thinking of taking this sort of approach, you can uh, do something indoors, or you can also, if you have the means to do something outside, you can have an outdoor uh, altar, or what's referred to as a, a herger. These are also historical. There, there's definite uh, documentation of uh, stones stacked up to represent the, the sacred grove or the, or the vey, as it were. As it were. That, that's an uh, Old Norse word for basically like a, an outdoor altar, an outdoor uh, ritual space. Um, and it's also to remember that, uh, it's also important to remember rather that the people that we share space with, right, our families, it is heathenry at its core, a tribal folk way. It, it truly shines best. Heathenry truly shines best when people of like minds can assemble and build traditions that, or customs that are going to work with each other. You know, so kind of like what we're doing here and the way, way, way the hearth is doing things, you know, we're sharing in their traditions and giving each other, you know, uh, thoughts and ideas on how to develop our own traditions. And these activities can allow for things to happen amongst ourselves that reflect various heathen worldviews. So when it comes to your relationships and in, in, in with all of the various components of, of heathenry, you know, your ancestors, the, the, the whites of the home and the land around you, you know, people will then wonder, well, where do I, when, when do the gods take over? When do, when, when do I look into working with the gods? And when it comes to building relationships with the sacred, one of the places that a lot of people start with is, is looking to the lore and the mythology, to understanding the various characteristics of the gods that you're going to be interacting with, you know, understanding the, the, the personality or the characteristics of Thor and Freya and Tyr or Odin or any some of the other ones that have documents, uh, documented stories about them. But that's really just, you know, scratching of the surface, right? Knowing the personality or the characteristics or reading a story about how someone or something did, you know, X, Y, Z, that doesn't tell you how to do anything, you know? So there's very, again, little written information on how the gods were venerated on the individual or hearth level. There's plenty of stuff that we can read about how they were, how it was done, where there was a community setting, where there were people around, and you know how the bloat was done and what was done. I'm going to be talking a little bit about that here in a little while. But at the individual level, it's there's there's not much, if anything, that we can take from. So uh, that's where it comes down to developing your own hearth cult, focusing on your ancestors and the Vatir and becoming solid with that, because then when you have those root things established, you'll be better equipped to approach 
your relationships with the divine or the sacred. All right, so I'm going to go into a heathen worldviews. Now, this is this is not one-on-one type stuff, and this is honestly not uh, a. Uh, this isn't something that I could cover even on a, on a topic in and of itself in, in an hour. It's, it, we're, we're talking about restructuring the way we view the world and the way the, we perceive things and the way the world works. But I'm going to mention a few things that are definitely part of a heathen worldview. Um, some things that the words themselves, their definitions, mean different things in a Germanic worldview. So I want to start with the concepts of good and evil. And... Uh, this, this one itself could, could, again, just be in a lesson besides it, you know, just the concept of good and evil. Um, so I'm going to do my best to summarize it. These are, you know, basic concepts that mean something more than just their inherent definition of what is good, what is evil, right? You ask anybody what is good, what is evil, you, you'll get probably all similar answers. And that is, you know, in ancient times now, societies had a... Um, pretty strict view of it, you were either in or out. It was, it was inner, outer um, views of things. And so what was within was where the order and where society functions and, and what was without was the wild and there was no uh, law. There was no, <laughs> thank you, there was no law in the wild. There was the wild and you were at its mercy, right? So what that means is that there are more precise definitions of what is good and evil beyond the, their just moral uh, meanings, okay? Heathen conceptions of good and evil um, appear to have been expressed in opposition between, again, human society, which is what was within, um, and it's identical to whatever the law uh, dictated, right? Because within there is law, there is order, and that law and that order protects the members of, this, of that society. And the wilds, or that which is beyond the sanctity of that, that inner space, is not subject to, to those laws. So in the Germanic heathen worldview, good, the word good, what is good, is deemed that which is lawful and right in order for society to function properly, while that which is evil opposes that. So specifically, right, you know, what, what are some good things? What are some evil things? Yeah, sure, there's, there's going to be things that's, you know, uh, is it good to kill somebody? Probably not. In Germanic times, in ancient times, there were times when it was fine to kill somebody because they deserved it, you know, or they did something that that was the recompense, that was the, the, the penalty of, we're not, we're not living in those times anymore, guys, right? So somebody does something wrong to you, you can't just, I mean, you can, but you suffer the repercussions of the law because what the law says is that you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that right? Okay. Sin. This is one that most people, I think, first coming into heathenry think has no place in heathenry, the concept of sin. So it may surprise you that sin is a concept that exists in heathenry, but it is not in the same sense or definition as, say, a Christian concept is. It's, it's not so much the breaking of divine law, although breaking of divine law, there, there, there's a connection between the law and order um, and its connection to inner versus outer yards, the inner yard versus the outer yard, this concept of what is within is sacred, what is within is lawful, what is within is good, and what is without of that inner yard, that inner circle, as it were, um, is unlawful, outlawry, that sort of thing. Um, so it's not, it is, it does have some connections to the breaking of divine law, but divine law is that which is um, not again, uh, it's again, it's not something like in the Christian sense, you know, laws that were mandated or brought down from a holy mountain by a man with, you know, uh, two tablets of stone and that sort of thing. It's, it's different. It's what, what divine law is considered in a Germanic context is, uh, you know, that which is lawful, that which is good, that which is of, of order. Um, but it has some connotations to that, but also a, a, a word that probably meant something uh, of, of that which is to remain stagnant. Because to do nothing in ancient times, inaction was seen as a crime. So if you didn't do certain things, if you just remained stagnant and, and chose not to take action, um, it, was, it was considered a crime in that which was unlawful, hence against law, against what was that of order, right? So it was considered sin. Um, the, the, the theme, again, is, is that to do something is better than to do 
nothing. Okay, so to do things, to do something, to take action of any sort is better than to do nothing or to, t or to you know, be inactive, not to take action. Uh, the next concept that we're referring to or that we're looking at uh, is worth. So worth is something placed on an individual by their people. A person is of, quote-unquote, worth, depending on many factors, such as what, they, uh, what do they do to contribute to you know, society, our community, tribe, etc. Worth, as it is understood in Germanic context, is the value of a person based upon their deeds, whether they are honorable or lawful. Usually a person who adheres to the laws customs and traditions of their tribe were, were seen at this time as having great worth, okay? Um, because as, as such, as they were doing these things, as they lived lawfully, right, they were behaving uh, in a way that is honorable. So they behaved with honor. Um, and it all ties in back into the, the first concept I covered, which is, again, the concepts of good and evil. A good person, one who behaves lawfully, and adheres to the traditions and customs of their people, had honor. And again, this is in an ancient Germanic heathen uh, context. So as such, they were therefore given great worth by their people. Uh, the next on the line is frith. And this one is probably the one that is most misused in, in, the, in the sense of, of, of a word or a phrase that is used, but it is, it is the one most misused or misunderstood, especially by newer heathens. Uh, for the most part, it usually gets thought of as just the heathen, quote-unquote, heathen word for peace, but it's much more than just that. Um, ancient heathens perceived uh, three primary focuses of Frith. Okay, so uh, Frith, between kin... Um, Kinships and kindreds, right? Families and extensions of families. The second factor was frith in the, in the sense of this web of loyalty that is created among leaders, their their tribes, their their, their, their tribes people, right? The third wellspring of frith arose from the relationship between us, the people, and the gods as well as other whites of the land and, and you know, your ancestors and all that. It, it, it all, it's all tied in. Um, so the idea of Frith is very closely tied to kinship, blood kinship in particular, but it extends to kinship through marriage, adoption, fostering. Um, the words Frith and Sib, if you guys have ever heard the term Sib, we get... This, uh, the word sib, where we see our, word, uh, our modern English word sibling, right? Brothers, sisters, right? Sibling. But um, frith and sib were often used interchangeably to describe the state of people involved in a sort of kindred relationship. You know, so you can call it a tribe, you can call it a kindred, you can call it a clan, whatever you want to call your group. Um, but the term did not merely indicate that material fact of blood relationship had to be there. It was rather described as the essence of the relationship itself. The joys, the responsibilities, interdependence, burdens, and benefits are all characterized in, in Frith. So it's this, it, it means so many things. It's one word that means so many things. There's obligation that's tied to, to Frith. You know, I'm obligated to my tribe as they are obligated to me. And Again, there's, there's peace that's a part of it all, but it, it goes much more in depth than just, than just the whole peaceful description. A few more here I want to talk briefly on this one word called thew, T-H-E-W or T-H-E-A-W, depending on the spelling of if you're looking at it from the, an old English. But this is an old English word, and it quite literally means law in a heathen context, and it refers typically nowadays to the customs and traditions of a tribe of heathens. It's usually only used among like the Saxon or Anglo-Saxon heathen circles, but if you ever hear Thu, that's the tribe's laws. It's not necessarily, you know, they're usually going to align with greater laws, but uh, the customs, the practices, the traditions of the tribe is, is, is Thu. 
All right, so next a couple ones are going to be Orlog and Weird. So Orlog, or Orle, sometimes used in, in old English uh, pronunciation, is quite a complicated concept to explain, especially since there's no real modern Western equivalent for this. But the word itself translates to as uh, first law, or more accurately, that which was laid. It is the defining template of a person that sets them on their course of life. Everyone is born with a unique orle, orlog, that they have or that they do not share with anyone else. Next one is weird. So if orle, orlog, is how one begins, it is easy to see why people misunderstand weird as how one ends, one's fate or destiny, as it were. However, this is not quite accurate. Uh, weird is better described as the threads that connect us to every other person, creature, and entity around us. Weird is also the tapestry we weave with those threads when we interact with our world. Any action that an individual takes not only changes their own weird, but also the weird of others. It leaves an imprint on those whom their action affects, whether the individual realizes it or not. Conversely, an individual's weird can be changed by events outside of their control. Whether those events began as someone else's actions or as whatever the norms uh, wove into reality. Therefore, it is impossible for heathens to view themselves as existing within a vacuum, separate from and unaffected by the world around them. What affects one affects many. We're going to move now into uh, heathen rituals, we're talking about the topics of heathen rituals. Now, a very common question that newer heathens ask is, how do I perform a ritual, or quote-unquote bloat? Uh, so it should be important to know some differences between certain quote-unquote types of rituals, and if one wishes to learn how to perform them. So remember, as I mentioned before, that there is a very little known about the how, right? How ancient Germanic peoples practice their spiritual folkways. You'll find some clues and possible examples scattered throughout more than 700 sagas as well as regional folklore. But you won't really find an instruction manual on the topic, right? Because this is, this is because the Germanic tribes were largely illiterate and most traditions were passed down orally. So it wasn't until around the Viking Age and Christianity began to spread that scholars and scribes took any interest in attempting to preserve ancient pagan customs. And even then, the influence of Christianity certainly leaked into the mix, even impacting how the tales of myths were retold. Nonetheless, there are some things we do know and can use to piece together how a heathen ritual is performed. Now, first, I want to talk about the differences between a bloat and an offering, or a feigning, sometimes they refer to as. Historically speaking, the term bloat meant that there was actual blood used from an animal sacrifice. One such example is mentioned in one of the Eddic texts called Heimskringla, and I'll quote as, it was an old custom, or foreign sailor, when they made a bloat for all the bonders to come to the cult house, or hof, and bring their food which they would need as long as the feast lasted. At that feast, the men should drink, or the men should all drink ale. There they also slaughtered all kinds of cattle and horses, and all the blood which flowed from them was called laut. The, the bowls in which the blood stood were also called laut bowls and laut tainer, which were used to sprinkle. With all this, they should stain the stalls red, and likewise the hof, walls inside and out, and likewise sprinkle it on all the men. The flesh was cooked as meat for the guest feast. So this is just one of many examples that specifically state that bloat requires blood. 
the methods used here are quite often the basis or foundation of many heathens to perform their own rituals, whether blood is incorporated or not. Now, there's also some uh, sources that state alcohol and food make acceptable offerings. Again, often referred to as feignings. Um, one such example can be read in a passage from uh, Ibn Fadlan, writing about his travels with the Swedish Rus, circa 950 AD. This passage also shows food and other items being used in the offering. When the ships come to this mooring place, everybody goes ashore with bread, meat, onions, milk, and intoxicating drink, and betakes himself to a long upright piece of wood that has a face like a man's. Um, so anyway, the, the, the piece of wood had a face like a man's, and it's surrounded by little figures, behind which are long stakes in the ground. The Rus prostrates himself before the big carving and says, O oh my lord, I have come from a far land and have with me such and such a number of gifts and such and such a number of sables. And he proceeds to enumerate all his other wares. Then he says, I have brought you these gifts and lays down what he has brought with him and continues, I wish that you would send me a merchant with many dinars and dirhams who will buy me from me whatever I wish and will not dispute anything I say. And then he goes away. So there was an obvious feigning to a deity. Don't know which deity it was. If it was the Swedes, it was probably prayer. We can maybe guess. Um, but these are obviously feignings or, or giftings, offerings to a deity that were not called in the text. They were not referred to as, as, as bloat. So bloat is something typically reserved exclusively for the gods. You can gift to the Vaitir, you can gift, you know, to the gods as well, but if it's bloat, it's historically at least, right, been reserved for when you're interacting and uh, appealing to the gods. Um, there are a number of other heathen rituals. Again, don't have the time to go into them all right now and today, uh, but uh, there's, you know, there's something called sumble, which is more or less a it's, it is a ceremony, it is a ritual, and it's usually done indoors with drinks being uh, spoken over, and there's boasts and toasts and oaths and stuff that go into that. We can maybe talk more about that around, you know, throughout the day, but too much to go into right now. So there's obviously much more to heathenry than just what I was able to try to sum up here and, and share today. I gave my best shot at kind of giving you guys a, a crash course introduction into, you know, some things that I believe, at least, to be very important for anyone thinking of pursuing heathenry as a spiritual or religious practice. It is a practice. It's a lifetime of learning, uh, studying, practicing, actually doing it, and, and experiencing it. You know, heathenry is, is grassroots. It's boots on the ground. It's doing. No one, like as I told you guys before, and as Jared mentioned yesterday, should ever tell you how to heathen, and if they do then you should probably find someone else to hang out with and share your time and spend energy uh, exchanging between. So, as we talked earlier about how inaction was seen as a crime, it's better to do something than to just not do anything. Figure it out as you go. When I first came into heathenry, you know, I was doing all kinds of stuff that now I would look back on and go, well, that worked for me at the time, but it doesn't work for me now. Your practices, you know, your life is going to change, it's going to evolve, and it's going to become something new and different as, as you grow and as you advance. So just go out and do. Go out and do. Mm. Well, the video cut off there at the end, and as you can probably tell, that was basically the end of, of my, uh, my lesson. And it ended abruptly, but it ended on a note that I think really just says all that it needs to. Go out and do. Right, hail the doers. Right, if all you're all if all you're uh, ever going to be is is well, I wonder what it would be like. I thought about it, but I didn't do it. What tales will be told about you? Right, and I know that not every approach to heathenry is gonna echo the same, or or, or you know, you're not gonna. Not everybody's gonna approach 
heathenry per se, you know, with the same degree of, of interest or with the same focuses. And nobody should, right? I mean, yes, there is a place for groups of people gathering together, like-minded people achieve, wanting to achieve the same things, and they all mutually agree to do it in the same way, whether it's by, you know, but again, it, it's by doing it. It's, it's, it's by actively living it. So um, if all you're going to do is sit and think about it, then you're going to get left in the dust. I mean, just to be honest, you're going to be left in the dust because people that are the doers, that are seeking to make something happen, are going to be out there doing it. And so when it's time for the ship to set sail, you're either going to be standing on the shore wishing you had boarded, or you're going to be on that ship, and you're going to be helping that ship set sail, and you're going to be helping do the things that, you know, make for a successful journey, and you're going to be there for all of the all of the stops along the way. It is, and it's it's about the journey. You know, it's not about where we're going to arrive at per se. It's it's what are we going to figure out along the way? What 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 stories will be told of us for the journey? What what is the the story that our descendants will tell? of us around their fires, around their hearth fires, around their campfires, around other meetings of, of like-minded people. Our names, our reputations do not die. Cattle die, kinsmen die, and we ourselves will die as well. But one thing that I know will not die is the fair fame of one who has earned it. Our reputation will not die. So the things that are remembered are the deeds, are the actions, are the doing of things. Nobody remembers the person who thought about doing something. You know, they remember the people, they remember the ones who did it. So go out and do. Go out and do. Like I said, that's this week's episode of the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, and I hope you enjoyed it. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, if you do enjoy it, be sure to engage in any sort of way possible, whether it's by liking the video, sharing the content, upvoting it, writing into the podcast as well, sharing your thoughts with me directly through any of the social media platforms that are, are out there for, uh, for Midgard Musings, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Patreon. It's all down there in the Linktree link, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in today, listening and watching to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. I greatly appreciate all of your support. Until we see each other again, may the gods continue to notice you, and may your ancestors smile upon you. <laughs>